Thanks a lot for coming. Uh, I applaud what you're all working on, trying to figure out how to bring the entrepreneurial spirit uh, to new areas. But I also want to challenge some of the things you've been talking about and to build a larger frame uh, for thinking about how we make a better economy. Uh, so first thing I want to start with is the notion that we're heading for a world in which technology will put people out of work. You know, I, I love the idea of universal basic income, but it strikes me in so many ways as an example of what T.S. Eliot called, uh, this last temptation is the greatest treason to do the right deed for the wrong reason. We don't need universal basic income because there w is not enough work to do, right? Uh, really? You know, what the hell? Uh, you know, look at this. We've got to deal with climate change. We've got to rebuild our infrastructure. We've got to feed the world. We've got to end disease. We've got to resettle you know, tens of millions of refugees. We've got to care for each other better than we do. We've got to educate the next generation. And we have an incredible opportunity in the economy to enjoy the fruits of shared prosperity. I mean, when people have money, they share it with each other. They build things for each other. They create for each other. You know, and we are depriving ourselves of that opportunity because of some fundamental flaws in our economy and the way we think about it. So I want to start out by asking, what's keeping us from working on stuff that matters? And the first thing, and this is really a theme uh, throughout this book I just published about what we learned from technology about the future of the economy, is that our maps of the world can steer us wrong. Back in 1625, they thought that California was an island, and people literally had expeditions where they brought boats uh, to get across what turned out to be the desert because there was no island. It was just, uh, it was just a big uh, uh, peninsula at the bottom, and they thought the water went all the way up. They were wrong. It took them 100 years to correct that, that bad map. Now, we have a lot of bad maps, and part of the job of entrepreneurs is to challenge the maps that we live in. You know, back when uh, Larry and Sergey started Google, one of the things they said was, we hate advertising. We hate the way advertising has become so intrusive. We want something different. They didn't know what it was yet. But they eventually found a model and developed a model that made Google into one of the great companies because they rejected the current model and they said, we believe there has to be something better and we're going to work for it. You know, you look at what, uh, you, know, you think about... Uh, taxi cabs in 2005. The connected taxi cab was a screen in the back showing ads. And then we figured out, wow, there's so much more we can do with today's technology. So today, we think it's technology that's going to put people out of work. I want to make the case that it's something else entirely. But here's what actually happened when Amazon added 45,000 robots to their warehouses between 2014 and 2016. They added 250,000 human workers. Why? Because they didn't just do the same thing more cheaply. That's the big mistake, one of the cardinal sins in our economy, is we're going to do the same thing. We're just going to do it with less inputs, and so we'll make more money. Right? But great companies do more. Amazon said, well, we're going to put uh, more products into the warehouses. We're going to get them out faster. I don't know about uh, all of you, but I have gotten products the same day. And I remember when it used to be you know, you think when you order them online, they took a week, you know, maybe two weeks. And they basically keep upping the ante. And that's one of the things that we have to do with our economy. We have to actually stop saving money and start doing more. This clicker is not working. Yeah, so do more. Do things that were previously impossible. Think about that in all of your startups. Also, think about how you should not replace people. You should use the new technologies to augment them. You know, that's what we did with the first industrial revolution. We were able to create more productivity because people could do more with the help of technology. And the same thing is happening today. You know, when we, for example, empower, you know, healthcare workers, upskill them uh, with technology, we can allow for more human contact, we can allow for better services, we can uh, 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 allow for data-driven interventions uh, to get people the, the care they need when they need. We can actually change the structure of that industry. It's not a matter of saying, well, let's just do the same thing and get rid of people. 
to augment people. Now, this is what technology wants. It is to actually to do more. Uh, uh, Nick Hanauer, uh, who, if you don't know him, you should. He's somebody who's thought a lot about these issues. He, he, he said, prosperity in human societies is best understood as the accumulation of solutions to human problems. We won't run out of work till we run out of problems. And I just say, are we done yet? I mean, that's the fundamental thing. We keep talking about jobs and that somehow they're like, well, there's no jobs in the supermarket. They're out of toilet paper. You know, it's like, no, there's plenty of work to go around. There's something else that is keeping us from doing the work that needs doing. All right? So when I look for measures that we should be looking at, they're measures like this. Uh, this is from Our World in Data, which is a wonderful resource. This is what has happened as every country has industrialized. You've seen life expectancy go up. That's technology making people's lives better. We need to have more measures of actually, are we getting the outcome we want? Are we improving people's lives? And this whole subject of this event is that something is wrong. And it's not something is wrong on the internet. It's something is wrong, deeply wrong in our economy when the economy is making some people richer and it's making some people poorer. That's not right and we should not accept it. So we need more entrepreneurs like Elon Musk. I love, if you haven't read uh, Wait But Why's long exposition on Neuralink, he has this wonderful section in about two-thirds of the way in where he talks about uh, sort of Elon Musk's company formula, which is he starts out with this big idea of some way he wants to make the world better. And he says, okay, how can I make a self-sustaining business that will catalyze uh, basically uh, what uh, um, Wait But Why calls the human colossus to start working on this problem? And, of course, you think about something like Tesla, where he's, in fact, catalyzed this uh, ele uh, electric car industry. You think about uh, uh, SpaceX, again, catalyzing human space exploration again. And, uh, I think with Neuralink, he's trying to catalyze uh, a, a sort of new, new neurotech industry. Think about how do we actually invent a powerful new future, not just little tweaks. And here's another bad map. In 2018, we still believe that it's acceptable for companies to maximize profit, regardless of the social, environmental, and human consequences. We think, well, we can have a little tweak like a B Corp. I think a B Corp is, again, a wonderful idea, but it's wrong because it's accepting as the status quo that the ordinary corporation is a psychopath. It's accepting that the ordinary corporation is hostile to humans is basically doing things that are hostile to our world and our betterment. I don't accept that. I believe that every corporation needs to have an understanding of its entire ecosystem and be making things better. So it's ever more dangerous, this idea that corporate profit above all. And I'll tell you why. Because we're increasingly all living and working inside a great machine. Uh, there's a, uh, there's uh, ways that we see this in media. You know, we understand that the knowledge that we get is increasingly shaped by algorithms. You know, the, the news that we get from social media, the results that we get from Facebook are chosen for us. And so we, but we are also feeding into those systems. We are telling them what to do through our collective action. There's vast systems that combine humans and machines. Now, this guy working inside the Google data center is symbolic. But think about also uh, a, an Uber or Lyft driver is engaged in this vast machine that's digital, physical. This digital world that we thought of was just media is now coming to the real world. And here's the thing. These systems are increasingly driven by by AI, by big data, and by algorithms. Now, when Elon Musk said AI is the most serious threat to the survival of the human race, he was maybe being a little uh, histrionic. But if you actually unpack the thinking behind the uh, fear of AI, here's what it is. It's the idea of what they call the runaway objective function. Now, Elon, in a Vanity Fair, um, uh, uh, article, uh, interview uh, sort of talked about the runaway strawberry picker. It's like, here's a robot self-improving. It gets better and better. And it's been told what to do, which is get better and better at picking strawberries. 
And of course, it eventually decides that humans are in the way of strawberry fields forever. Right? Now, that seems far-fetched, right? It seems far-fetched. But just think about Facebook and fake news, right? Because here it is. Here, here's, here's Mark Zuckerberg telling the algorithms, you know, show people more of what they want. Show them more of what they ask for. And here's Mark Zuckerberg today, right? Oh, my gosh, this algorithm, this set of algorithms didn't do quite what we expected, right? It actually amplified hyperpartisanship. It broke apart communities. It didn't reinforce community. And he and his team are frantically saying, how do we re-engineer the algorithms to get the result that we actually wanted? And we're expecting Facebook to do that. But why is it that we look at this other vast, world-spanning digital system, our financial market, and it's creating all kinds of terrible outcomes. And we're not asking that system to fix itself, to take responsibility for its outcomes. That is not a Google data center. That's a financial system data center. Right? And what is the objective function of our financial markets? Milton Friedman in 1970 said the social responsibility of a business is to increase its profits. Now, that's a lot like Mark Zuckerberg's idea that if we just showed people more of what they liked and responded to, that would be good. It would make good, you know. And Milton Friedman thought, yeah, this will really build a better economy. And it seemed to for a while. But, you know, they didn't mean to create an opiate crisis. They didn't mean to gut our economy. But, in fact, that is what is happening today. And we actually have to question the fundamental structure of this objective function that we have given our companies and our financial markets. And we have to look in the mirror because every time you make a startup and what you're really trying to do is have an exit where you sell it to somebody based on the promise of what it might become in the future, you're participating in that system. You're not actually creating a company that's creating services for people. You're not necessarily creating real value. So this is the point well, we really have to understand the adoption of this uh, shareholder value hypothesis really happened in the 80s. And that's when we saw this divergence of real median family income and productivity. And you can see that productivity has continued up and to the right. And it's going to continue up and to the right. The world is going to become more and more productive. It's going to become richer and richer. And the fundamental question is, why are we not sharing that productivity anymore? And so, you know, I'm really worried that there's plenty to go around, and it's just not going around. And we have to completely reshape our economic uh, system. And that's why the third and most dangerous sort of bad map that we're living with is that we're just trying to recreate, continue the existing system rather than asking ourselves, what's possible today with this amazing superpower that technology is giving us? Why are we still building the old world? It's a little bit like the revolution that we had was we moved away from land as the source of wealth into the Industrial Revolution. It was this huge restructuring of the economy. We are due for another huge restructuring of the economy. As the machines do more of the work, we maybe we need to say, no, let them do more of that work. Let's figure out what the economy will look like as the machines do more and more and more. What is uniquely human? And are we going to invest in that future? And I think, you know, there's this wonderful essay, if you haven't read it, you all should, by John Maynard Keynes, written at the height of the Great Depression. It's called Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. We talked about 100 years from now. That's actually about 10 years from now. Uh, he said the world of our grandchildren the, would be faced for the first time with mankind's real his permanent problem, how to use the freedom from pressing economic cares, how to occupy the leisure which science and compound interests have won, to live wisely and agreeably and well. Why aren't we building that dream economy? Because we are approaching that moment. Coming back to this idea of universal basic income, uh, economist Brian Arthur did the calculation recently, if the total U.S. household income of $8.5 trillion were shared by the 116 million households equally, we'd each earn $73,000, which is enough for a decent middle-class life. Now, 
uh, Brian Arthur comes to the conclusion, which I have also come to, that the fundamental economic question today is no longer about how do we incentivize production. We're doing pretty well there. It's how to incentivize fair distribution. And we need to look at alternate economic models. You know, when we look at a company like REI, which is a co-op, it actually outperforms all the public companies that are uh, you know, in its, its sector, except in profit, because it gives it back to its customers. So different economic models are possible. And we need to explore those economic models. Uh, uh, so this is one of the last things I really want to take away from technology. We are at a period where the algorithmic systems that we are increasingly enmeshed in can have different, more complex objective functions. We can design our marketplaces. And again, we are entering an era of platform capitalism where there are great platforms that are basically enablers for the rest of society. You think about the way that, that uh, Google connects people to content or Facebook. You think about the way our financial markets could, in a, in a positive world, be knitting our economy together and providing support for a rich ecosystem. And the fact is, these are matching marketplaces. And there's a wonderful book, which actually was pointed, I was pointed to by the chief economist at Uber, and it's called Who Gets What and Why, written by an economist who won the Nobel Prize for the redesign of kidney transplant marketplaces. What he figured out is if you can create marketplaces where there's more trust, you can actually, in this particular case, get more kidneys transplanted because there were basically design problems. And that idea that you can design marketplaces runs all through the great technology platforms of today. And the fact that we could build a marketplace that actually distributes the fruits of human productivity more fairly you know, gets us out of the old paradigms of, well, it's either central planning or it's the unfettered free market you know, determined by uh, the profit motive. Maybe there are smarter, better ways to do this allocation using more signals, because these systems use way more signals today than the systems that we used to uh, rely on. You know, even taking that you know, kind of breakthrough of the first internet era, uh, the Google ad auction, you know, one of the great breakthroughs was that they didn't sell to the highest bidder. You know, we have lived for, you know, uh, hundreds of years with this idea that price signaling is the way that you coordinate a market. And Google figured out that actually figuring out what people really wanted, you know, the, the likelihood to click was a signal that you put together with the price signal, and then you actually get better outcomes because you show people ads that they really want. You think about the way that they show the results. They're trying to take hundreds of different signals to come up with better ways to show the content that people want. And I think there's a really interesting opportunity for us to think about what would the economy look like if we weren't optimizing for the wrong thing, if we were optimizing for human welfare. Uh, so I think I just want to leave you with this question. We are in a period where we have to stop doing these little tweaks. We have to stop putting the screen in the back of the taxi cab. We have to start saying, what will technology allow us to do today? Can we, in fact, tackle the world's great problems? Can we, in fact, create a world of prosperity where the machines do things? And we don't say, well, the owners of the machines get all the results. But instead, we find new ways to distribute the, the results of that. And we actually understand that when more money goes around to more people, and maybe it's not even money, but whatever it is we use as the circulatory system of our economy, that actually that's better for everyone. Uh, again, wonderful quote from Nick Hanauer. Uh, we all do better when we all do better. Thank you. Tim, Tim, Tim. No? stay on stage. Uh, just, I just got a quick change up. Uh, we, we have time for, for a couple of questions, but in the mean, because we want to go straight, actually skip the break, because we, we had that big breakout and we're running behind. So we're going to go straight to the next session. So I want to make sure that um, Tiffany, uh, Dan, Terry, and Amy all get mic'd up for the next session. We're going to go straight to you, okay? Um, and in the meantime, we have a couple of minutes for Tim to take questions, if, if you're okay with that, Tim. Sure, plan. happy to. It's a provocative presentation, and so we'd love, yeah.
Is there any way to think about the personal benefits to be uh, created into some formal economic model that provides a way to invest and benefit those things? Well, first of all, I, I really, I, I have a really allergic reaction to the entire system of investment that we have today. You know, when, uh, you know, we, we're so trapped in the model of sort of financial outcomes. You know, think about it for a minute. Carl Icahn buys $6 billion of Apple stock. Was that an investment? No, it was a bet. So much of what you guys are talking about when you talk about investing is betting. You know, there's a big horse race. Imagine a horse race where people uh, are able to trade expectations of, you know, like the odds are 16 to 1, the odds are 32 to 1. Yeah, we got to change that model up. For, so, so I'm not really thinking about, I'm, I'm thinking about how do we build systems in which people are creating value for each other. Now, again, I, there are economic outcomes, but I, as I like to say, money is like gas in the car. You don't want to run out, but you're not doing a tour of gas stations. So you have to be purpose-driven first. And if you have a purpose, like I look at my company, we're a couple hundred million dollars in revenue, we've been profitable with the exception of the dot-com bust uh, for 35 years. Uh, we've grown incrementally, um, but we've always focused on our goal is to create more value than we capture, to enable others. We're basically an information business. We publish books, we develop conferences, uh, we have an online learning platform. And all of it's been about measuring ourselves by how much we enable for other people. And we sit there even as a, in our strategy. I was so proud, as I'm not really uh, uh, act, as actively involved in the day to day, but I was so proud of my management team. My, my president CEO called this emergency management meeting about our platform. We'd introduced a new feature. Uh, you know, we, we, it was sort of a live online training as opposed to video or ebook training. And she said, we have a real problem. Uh, we, we, had, we, we brought this to market. We, we'd asked all of our partners to participate in it, but we had brought uh, 100 new courses to market, and our partners had only brought 10. And as a result, we were taking too much of the pie. I mean, how many companies say, whoa, we have a problem. We're taking too much of the pie. And it was like, we have to go out. We have to evangelize them more, bring them up to speed to get them into the marketplace. Because we understand that our fundamental business is a marketplace. And we, in, 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 in fact, added that feature to the platform because we were saying, wow, as, as books decline, we have to find a new income source for the people who create content for us. So we actually were searching through the possibility space because it wasn't just about us. It wasn't just about our customers. It was also about our suppliers. Now you think about, is Amazon thinking that way? Where they go, wow, look, here's a good product. Let's actually uh, you know, take over that product category and compete with our suppliers. Uh, look at Google. Google used to get 50% of its revenue from advertising on uh, uh, third-party sites back in 2000. It's down to 18% today because they're investing in themselves much faster than they're investing in their ecosystem. We need to change that. We need to understand how to build the virtuous circles. That's the kind of economy you guys are all talking about. How do we build a virtuous circle that makes everybody richer? And you have to think that way. Think platforms, think ecosystems, think how you enable others, not just how you build your own business. I'm not sure that's not really what you were asking, Dave, but... Uh, I do think that, you know, if you look at uh, the, the fundamental thing is to make sure that there's enough, uh, whether it's money or uh, attention or whatever, that you're actually making it circulate. We need to measure circulation. You know, velocity, velocity of, of, uh, uh, of money in a system is, is, is critical. Yeah, I actually have a little bit of a story that um, yeah. illustrates that. So we're a collaborative robotics company. So yep. everything we do is humans and robots working together. Yep. And one of our engineers experienced this in a facility we were working in where he put, we had put in some collaborative robots. And one of the line workers came up and basically yelled at him and said, are you putting in robots to take our jobs? And he didn't know how to respond. And then the guy got mad and said, well, how would you feel if a robot took your job? And his response, and it was terrible, was that would be great. I would just go home and play video games all day. And it just made it even worse. Mm -hmm. So I had to go in and actually, you know, talk to the to workers that were there. And, uh, and as we kind of walked through the process, I asked him, I said, well, if, you know, if you didn't have to do this job, but maybe you were a, a mentor to kids in the city and you got paid to do that, would that be okay? And he said, yeah, I'd, I'd really love to do that. 
Yeah. And so as we started to talk more, it wasn't that he was scared the robot would take his job. He was scared the robot would take his purpose. Yes, absolutely. And the thing that's so interesting, like people find a purpose. And, you know, we have built a, a, a system that, you know, lets some people have purpose. And we kind of assume, well, you know, most people wouldn't know what to do if we took away their, their job. And it's partly because we haven't you know, created opportunity for that purpose to be valued. Yeah, I mean, the big thing is they're just spending so much time trying to take care of their families that if they, they knew that their needs, needs would be met, they, I think they'd be more socially active. Like, they would get paid to be a good citizen. And right. I think most people would do that. Ab absolutely. I mean, being a, being a good citizen, taking care of your family, uh, having more social time. I mean, there's so many places where people are happy, uh, you know, without much work. And, uh, you know, or they're, they're, they're finding, they're making work, you know, and, and there's so much creativity that's untapped in our society. Yeah, go on. So one other suggestion, um, you know, the notion of pricing externalities into things like, tobacco yeah. taxes and sugar taxes. What about pricing the externalities of the value created by those mentors or teachers? Or Absolutely. I, I think we need different economic metrics. And, and the thing that I said I, I, I kind of tried to hint at there is uh, when I think about um, our current economic models are very, very simple. And when I think about, you know, for example, Google search is an example where they're taking hundreds of factors into account. And you go, well, what if we had sort of you know, economic metrics that we were trying to manage to? You know, because you have to realize that our economy is managed. You know, we, we used to manage, for example, after World War II, we were really managing for full employment. And it wasn't until the 70s you know, and 80s that we, start, we started managing for low inflation and return to capital. You know, so we had a different objective function, and that's why everybody was, was employed. It had some bad effects, i.e. inflation. And then we go, okay, well, how do we collect? But what if we have a system that's complex enough to take multiple factors into account? What if we have a system where we're continually tuning it and adapting and building a system where we're saying, oh, okay, it's, it's a dynamic system. We're tilting it this way, that way, just like, say, an autopilot on a plane is tilting uh, and responding to wind gusts, to the you know, main direction we're going, but also to changing economic conditions. We're in a world where we're increasingly going to have that possibility for a much more complex and interesting way of responding to this vast collective system uh, of the economy. All right. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you.